uh, managing a glaucoma suspect and cracking the puzzle of a glaucoma suspect. So we have a keynote address uh, before we start the IC, and I'd just like to introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, he's Dr. Sundar Ramaswamy, uh, who is a consultant ophthalmologist at uh, Thompson Hospital at Kota Damasara, and he has come all the way from Malaysia. Uh, he uh, graduated from uh, the UKH University in Malaysia, and he did his uh, fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology from the SNEC Singapore. And he has been awarded the Excellence in Service Award by both the State Health Department as well as the Kuala Lumpur Hospital. So it's a pleasure to have him uh, in our IC. And uh, he'll be talking about uh, the balancing act in pediatric glaucoma surgeries. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Right. Uh, I'll start off. Right. Uh, life is not perfect. We have children like this who present to us. And in uh, our setup in Malaysia, the pediatric glaucoma work is done by pediatric ophthalmologists. It's not done by the glaucomatologists. So it's challenging in many ways. Yeah. So there are a few of us who have taken up this task, and I've been one of them, and I've been doing it for a few years now. Right. The thing with uh, these children is a clinic examination is always not easy. So most of the time I spend that I was just getting an idea and uh, basically counseling the parents, telling them that it's a long process, surgery is not once, most of the time there'll be repeat surgeries. And mainly we get the examination done under anesthesia in our setup. And we prefer to start off with ketamine. We use ketamine to check the IOP. We find that uh, we give it first, we wait a few minutes, let the uh, IOP settle, and that fi we find is the most accurate way compared to the inhalation anesthetics, which tend to drop the IOP. And we use the Perkins. Uh, that's been our gold standard. Uh, takes a little bit of practice, but over time we've uh, gotten good at it. Now we've also had the iCAP Pro that's very useful. It's an it's a added armamentorium in our practice. Uh, it's quite comparable, but once the, if it's a dysgenetic eye, then we don't get very accurate pressures. We still go back to the Goldman's. Uh, Perkins, sorry. Right. Now, the remainder of our examination is basically done with inhalation anesthesia, uh, where we actually proceed with the anterior segment examination. Then we do the uh, corneal uh, diameter measurements, corneoscopy where permissible. And uh, if the cornea is clear enough, and our if it's a repeat examination under anesthesia, then we go ahead with the fundus examination and on table refraction. And uh, this is generally how we've been doing it over the years, and we maintain that. Right. Now, what, the, what are the objectives of treatment in a child with uh, pediatric glaucoma? Now, one of that is keeping the IOP in, in a respectable range. That Now, we've accepted it as about 15 millimercuries, millimeters mercuries or lesser. And also to look at the other signs for no progression. That is, the corneal edema settles down as much as possible without recurrence. Uh, myopia doesn't progress because, you know, progressive myopia means that the pressure is not being controlled. And, of course, uh, looking at the optic nerve head and to make sure that the opt optic neuropathy or the cupping is not progressing. Right. Now, in terms of management, uh, drops in the smaller, uh, the toddlers or the younger children, it doesn't really work. It's just basically to, to temporize. And we uh, basically go towards beta blockers like Timolol or, you know, the anhydrous inhibitors like uh, dozolamide. We don't use your prostaglandin analogs in this age group because they just don't work, and it causes a lot of hyperemia. Uh, we don't use brominidin because uh, we've had a bad experience. Uh, we, you end up with apnea in these babies or children if they're very young, those below the age of four, so we keep, keep away from those. But at the end of the day, for the younger age group, those uh, to us less than eight years old, surgery is most of the definitive management yeah, in our, our practice. and. Coming back to the presentations now, with the PCGs, uh, of course, we all know the triad of epiphora, blepharospasm, and photophobia come with ophthalmic eyes, diameters normally more than 12 millimeters. 
They get corneal edema to various levels and of course the hub sci. Now, in our practice in Malaysia, we don't get very clear corneas most of the time. So we tend to have moved towards the baculotomy. Uh, that's our surgery of choice. Most of the time we get the trabecular meshwork. It, you know, it takes practice uh, in 80 to 90 percent of the time, 20, 30 percent, or 20 percent of the time we don't find it. It's difficult, you know, because there can be some anatomical variations. And, uh, over, you know, and with the refinement of technique, we find that we've gotten better with the hyphemas and we don't damage the iris root so much. Uh, what we tend to do is we tend to dissect with a bar parker blade. We don't use your 15 degree blades because it just cut too far. So this we can actually go fiber, fi fiber by fiber for fiber. We can get to a pat particular depth. And then we use the uh, crescent knife and we, we de-roof. And uh, when we do the, uh, when we actually reach the, the roof of the shlems, uh, sorry, we, we can actually, you know, de-roof it, put viscoelastic, push in a proline fiber in and get the passage proper without false with a false passage, and then pass in our, our hump trabeculotome. Once we've done the first pass, and we're going to do the reverse pass, I usually put viscoelastic in, and that's through a side port, so that we can actually fill it up. If you don't do that, your AC collapses, and you tend to tear the root, cause hyphema. And over time, we've, we've, uh, we've refined it to a certain extent that we are, we are more consistent with our outcomes. Do we do combination? Yeah, I think now in India, the trend is towards combination from the start. Uh, we tend to still do tuberculotomies. We do combination when we have to repeat cases or when the child is older, two years and older. Now, reason is because we prefer to use mitomycin C. We can do plain, but uh, the failure rates are probably the same. So with a bit of mitomycin C, it would not be prudent to do it at a younger age group. So we go two years and beyond. And uh, we tend to use very little, not too much, 0.2% over two minutes, and that's it. To me, honestly, we, we don't have very clear corneas, so we have not had much, we don't do too much. Our experience is limited. Uh, it's technically more challenging if you are not doing it often. Yeah, we, uh, the, the ones we have done a few the short scans and, you know, with the tilting of the microscope, uh, we do. But uh, mainly reserved for our uh, stage webbers, I would say, because sometimes others don't work. Right, so we get this sort of children coming to us, horrible anterior segment, this genesis. We do, t I think we have a gene pool in Malaysia, certain regions where you get more of these children coming from severe aniridia with keratopathies, and uh, they're very challenging to get these. Of course, we also have the other secondary glaucomas, the aphakics. We try to put the lens in most of our kids, but sometimes we can't, and about 20% of them develop aphakic glaucomas, or stage Weber syndromes. And of course, the rare neurofibromatosis, we get all of them get secondary glaucoma. So in these cases, we tend to do one of two. The first one being our trabeculotomies with mitomycin C. Uh, we, 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 we've actually, you know, in our practice, we modified, modified it a bit. We do larger peritomies. We dissect the phenons. We tend to do that. Uh, again, here we use a Bart Parker blade again to dissect the sclera. It goes easier with the, the, the layers. I mean, we can actually choose our depth. And uh, we do mitomycin C. We use it a bit longer. We're a bit more bolder here. We give 0.4% over four minutes, right? Uh, GDDs, yeah, we've been doing that for some time. We started with the Ahmads. We, we, we didn't get good results. And then we moved on towards the Bowell. And now we're using the RD from uh, Arvind, and we're getting good results with that. Fairly good, fairly good, yeah? Here again, we stand to the proline, and we don't do the Sherwood fenestration. So we find that it's just not, it's risky, and we overfiltrate. Right, but it's not without its problems. Tell you, we have problems. The ones are tube blockage, fibrosis, it becomes messy. Sometimes uh, we have corneal touch, uh, we've lost corneas also. We got conjunctival retraction, and recently we've also had this, where you know a child went for a holiday, came back with skin infection, and the endophthalmitis, we lost the eye. So we, these are not without its problems, full of problems, but you know, we have to tackle them. Uh, if not these children, natural history, they go blind. Right, refractory glaucoma. This is something we do sneak on and off. Like this child had trauma to the eye twice. The first time he had a bad corneal laceration. He had cat traumatic cataract. We did a PK for him, got the lens done, and then he traumatized the same eye again. And this time he ruptured, he had a dehiscence of the, the uh, 
graft, the sublaxated IO and corneal, I mean, a retinal detachment. And we had to go and repair that. And what happened was she had severe PAS and has fractured glaucoma. And you know, there's no space to do anything. You can't put your tubes in, you can't do your, 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 your traps. So what do we do? No, in the early on, we used to do the, the, the standard transpleural diode lasers. And um, this, uh, I mean, we don't get good results, to be honest. You know, it, it, it just lowers it for a while and the pressures come back up. And you know, it's just uh, a, a battle. And now, uh, what has happened in our part of the world, we've had Prof. Paul Chu from Singapore and US who's been doing a lot of work with uh, micropulse lasers with the G6 probe. And we've, we started using it on these children. And I know uh, a lot of people say, you know, this is dangerous, and a lot of inflammation. Uh, you may, you know, cause thysis and all that, but not really. We've been doing it in a fair number of children. We've got about 20 to 30 kids who have done, who've done this on all refractory cases, yeah? We don't use it as a first line of modality. And uh, we've been getting fairly better results. Sometimes the treatment needs to be repeated, maybe uh, twice, three times, and we tend to stabilize the pressures better. And of course, we may have to use drops after that. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's quite, it's very easy actually to do this. You just need to, you know, prep the child, use the scholastic on top of his conch, and then just use the probe and roll it superior inferior, leaving the three o'clock and nine o'clock positions uh, uh, free. And you can do it for about 50 seconds to 120 seconds uh, on each quad each half, yeah? So far, I've not had any real problems with it. Sometimes some mild pain, discomfort, but not really. And of course, the very advanced cases, uh, we could get these sort of children and, you know, we can't do much for them. So what we do suggest is sometimes for the parents, it may be a bit painful is to enucleate the eye, you know, because they're under risk of trauma, rupturing, we've had that before. And uh, we do agree, and you know, we do get good results. We get uh, nice prosthesis in, you know, and uh, implant prosthesis in, and they look much better, yeah? So that, sorry I rushed through because I know we have 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's uh, a nutshell. So I've actually put up how, uh, a summary of how I, in the, my practice, in the limited practice which we have there, how we go about doing our cases. And you know, for the PCGs, it's easier. We, we have a more cut, uh, 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 a logarithm, the sensor, the below two, so you do a trabeculotomy. If you're better at goniotomies, then you go ahead. The two to six year olds, you can do a tr combined trap, trabeculo, trabeculac, and the older ones, they do better at trabec and MCs. And you can do the GDDs as something to fall back on. Now, this genetic cases, it's a, a, a toss between your GDDs and your trabeculotomies and MMC. Now, if they become refractory, then you go ahead with your, your thyroid destructive procedures. No? And the uh, same goes for your AFK glaucomas. In the stage webers, yeah, you can try your goniotomies if they're a bit younger. Uh, later on, it's basically GDDs. Uh, the, uh, or if it really becomes refractory, then it's cyclodestructive procedures. But all in all, uh, pediatric glaucomas are difficult. Not many of us want to go there, but it's something that we have to do because the natural history is they, d they lose their vision and they need help. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It was a wonderful and comprehensive talk on how to manage pediatric glaucoma, uh, covering all the practical points also. Would anyone like to ask any question from Dr. Sundar? Okay. Oh, not yet, not yet. I know that we, we have the probes that have been passed, but we really haven't gotten down to that. Uh, I think if we were to do the standard tuberculotomies in our hands, and we, we do get fairly good results, and we seem to be refining it over time. So I think if, if and in terms of cost, I think it works out doing cheaper also. We have to look at it. Sure, yeah. Uh, correct. The 360, yes, that's a good idea, <laughs> something to think of. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank so you very much. much. Thank you for that. So, uh, now we move on to the IC, that is, uh, and we have the first speaker who will tell us uh, who a glaucoma suspect is. Uh, now we can have Dr. Sujata Wike. She's a consultant in Shankar Netrale Glaucoma Services and her research interests are uh, diurnal variation of IOP. So she'll walk us through what a glaucoma suspect is. 
very good morning. Uh, glaucoma suspects form a diverse group of individuals who pose a diagnostic dilemma. Since a diagnosis of glaucoma is in itself life-changing, can lead to depression, and change the quality of life of an individual, it's very important that we label these patients correctly. So my talk will deal with defining what is a glaucoma suspect. Individuals who do not definitely have glaucoma at the present time, but have characteristics due to which they are at high risk of developing the disease in the future, are termed glaucoma suspects. These characteristics are in terms of elevated intraocular pressure, suspicious angle, suspicious disc, or visual fields. We will deal with one of each of them one by one. Glaucoma suspect with elevated intraocular pressure the Goldman Appalachian Tonometer is a gold standard for intraocular pressure measurement. When we take measurements, we need to rule out erroneous sources of intraocular pressure measurement in terms of uncalibrated tonometers or tight neckties. It is very important to establish a good baseline. In terms of borderline uh, IOPs, we need to perform a diurnal variation test to know the IOP peak and fluctuations. It is mandatory to document the pachymetry, the central corneal thickness in all glaucoma suspects, since we know that in the Goldman Appalachian tonometer overestimates the IOP in thick corneas and underestimates it in thin corneas. The World Glaucoma Association consensus suggests that there should be no correction factor we need to use to adjust the values according to the CCT. But the CCT thus helps to stratify risk where thinner corneas are at a greater risk of developing glaucoma. Ocular hypertension is defined as intraocular pressure, more than two standard deviation above the population mean, which is about 21 in our population, with open angles, no evidence of glaucomatous optic neuropathy or visual field loss, with a normal central corneal thickness, and there is no other ocular or systemic cause contributing to the race IOP. This group is a very important group to identify, and we need to study associated risk factors because about 9.5% of untreated and 4.4% of the treatment group progress to glaucoma according to the ocular hypertension treatment study. Next, we move on to abnormal angles. Gonioscopy is a very important component of any comprehensive eye exam, not just the initial exam, but we need to repeat it periodically. In the Chennai glaucoma study, about 40% of patients who were labeled as open angle glaucoma turned out to be actually angle closure disease, which again goes to emphasize the importance of including gonioscopy as a part of a comprehensive eye exam. It's normally done with a four mirror gonio lens with the patient in primary gaze and dim light conditions, first without indentation and then with indentation. A primary angle closure suspect is defined as when the posterior trabecular meshwork is not visible in at least 180 degree of the circumference of the eye, with the gonioscopy being done in primary gaze without indentation. Gonioscopy not only helps to rule out angle closure, but also secondary causes of raised IOP like recession, pigment dispersion, peripheral anterior synechae. After IOP measurement and gonioscopy, it is very important to do a detailed disc exam and it's a stereoscopic view through a dilated pupil. A disc suspect is defined as one where the optic nerve head or retinal nerve fiber layer appearance is suspicious of glaucomatous damage with no definite visual field effect. It has other characteristics like an increased vertical cup disc ratio compared to the horizontal ratio. About 5% of normal population can have a vertical cup disc ratio above 0.7. In physiological cupping, it's generally bilateral and symmetrical without any focal neuroretinal rim loss. A cup disc ratio asymmetry greater than 0.2 should also raise the suspicion of glaucoma, though it may be present in 1% of normal population. It's also important to remember that in a small disc, the tendency to underestimate, and in a small disc, the tendency to overestimate glaucoma remains. This loss of the ISNT rule in glaucomatous disc, which is normally in normal disc, the inferior rim is the broadest, followed by the superior nasal and temporal. But even this rule is followed in only 70% of the eyes, and it applies only to normal size disc. Presence of retinal nerve fiber layer defects or disc hemorrhage also raises the suspicion of glaucoma. Disc hemorrhage is a very important predictive factor for the development of 
glaucoma. A visual field suspect is defined as one who has a definitive visual field suspicious of glaucomatous damage but not meeting set criteria. When we say set criteria, the defect should occur in an area of typical of glaucoma. It should be consistent with the clinical optic nerve head picture. In the first picture, we see an inferior notch and an inferior nerve fiber layer defect which is translating into the superior field, so it's correlating. Whereas in the second figure, we have a large disc with a large cup and it's not correlating to the visual field. So the first one is a definitive glaucomatous field, the second one is a suspicious field which we need to investigate further. A visual field should be reproducible on at least two occasions. It should not be explained by any other disease. For example, in this figure, you find a superior arcuate defect. But when you look at the fundus image, the disc is normal. It's, there's no glaucomatous cupping. It's a tilted disc. But there is an inferior retinochoroidal coloboma manifesting as a superior field defect. And whenever any visual field defect appears suddenly, it's unlikely to be glaucoma. So we need to think beyond. And the progression of a visual field loss is a hallmark sign which separates a true pathology from a suspect. Here in these figures, we see that these are visual fields which occur in the glaucomatous area, but a careful stereoscopic disc exam reveals a tilted disc or optic disc pit or coloboma are the morphological variations of the optic nerve head. The disc is suspicious, so are the visual fields, but we need to look beyond. To summarize, the entire glaucoma suspect spectrum includes ocular hypertensives, angle closure suspects, disc field suspects and those with a family history of glaucoma. So it's extremely important that we label these patients correctly and have considered the technical limitations of each of the parameters which we have used in our diagnosis and examination becomes appropriate. So we have our next speaker, Dr. Meyer, who will be elaborating on the evaluation algorithm of these suspects. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Sujata. You have nicely summarized what a glaucoma suspect is. So we need to define a type of glaucoma suspect, see the risk factors. It's basically a diagnosis of exclusion and patient communication when you break the news is also important. And the next presentation, as Dr. Sujata said, will be doc by Dr. Mayer, who is a consultant in a Nucleus and Lotus uh, Eye Hospital in Mumbai. And he was a consultant as well as a fellow in Shankar Nitrale with us and uh, he'll be talking about how to evaluate uh, a glaucoma suspect clinically in detail so that we can identify the risk factors which are available. Uh, while he's setting up, does anybody have any question for Dr. Sujata? disc evaluation and gonioscopy because it's really terrible if angle closure is missed in our population and it is as frequent as open angle glaucoma you're going to miss it unless you do a proper gonioscopy so I think that's something which you would really like to emphasize So good morning, one and all. Um, Dr. Maudavala here is going to be speaking on basic uh, evaluation algorithm in a glaucoma suspect. Okay, sorry. So I do not have any financial interest. Uh, so glaucoma suspect, as we already saw, is a susceptible individual or a group of people who are more at risk of developing glaucomas. They could either be open angle, closed angle, or secondary glaucomas. However, the hallmark sign which differentiates a true glaucoma patient from a glaucoma suspect is the presence of progressive uh, glaucomatous visual field loss, which is distinct from any neurological disease or any other non-progressive defects that mimic glaucoma. 
So aim of my presentation is basically just to highlight the importance of detailed and correct clinical history in all cases suspected of having glaucoma and importance of a thorough clinical examination of all eyes to pick up cases of suspected glaucoma. So evaluation protocol in all our cases is a detailed history taking, a good visual acuity examination, thorough slit lamp examination from the cornea to the anterior vitreous, always, always a Goldman's applanation tonometry, indentation gonioscopy with a four mirror lens, retina evaluation inclusive of the periphery, disc evaluation with uh, a 70-80 or a 90 adapter lens, basic ancillary investigations like central corneal thickness uh, uh, measurements, and uh, structural and functional investigations like the OCT and the perimetry. In the next few slides, with a few case examples which we normally see in our OPD, I'll try to highlight the importance of history and clinical examination in picking up glaucoma suspects. So our first case is a 38-year-old male who's just come in for a regular eye checkup, no issues with vision as such, but gives history of fa uh, family history of glaucoma in mother and in maternal aunt. He's a known myope, been wearing glasses since he was 10 years, and also gives us a history of trauma to the right eye with a ball 10 years ago. Is he a glaucoma suspect? Let's have a look. So on examination, best corrected visual acuity, both eyes, sorry, uh, was a 6, 6, and 6 with a minus 3 diopter sphere of myopia. Slit lamp, both eyes was normal. Anterior chamber in the right eye was slightly deep. Pressures, both eyes okay. Dis but gonioscopy of the right eye reveals almost a three quadrant angle recession. So what we see from this patient so far is there is family history, there is history of trauma, and there is myopia. Are these important risk factors? So family history, as we all know, is a very important risk factor because various population-based studies have told us that in patients of glaucoma uh, with family history and siblings were almost 3.6 times, 6, 9 times more susceptible to have glaucoma and around 2.17 times in second-degree relatives. And again, a, a paper from the Rotterdam Eye Institute also concluded that relatives of patients with glaucoma were at least 10 times more susceptible to a glaucoma than controls. Something as asymptomatic as anger recession, seen in almost 20 to 80% eyes with blunt trauma. 60 to 100% of eyes with the traumatic hyphema have anger recession. Up to 20% eyes of anger recession develop glaucoma, and this is more if the anger recession exceeds 180 degrees. Almost 50% of contralateral eyes also develop glaucoma. So these patients are more at risk of developing glaucoma. So in this patient, a family history positive, uh, history of myopia positive and anger recession, although DISC and IOP normal at the moment, is a glaucoma suspect and we need to follow him up closely. Steroid use. Steroid use in any form, and in the past, present, whether in the form of ocular drops, ointments, intravitreal injections, periocular steroids, inhalational use for asthma, uh, to or topical use for in the form of skin ointments, lotions, uh, uh, oral medications at, are at risk of developing glaucoma because almost 18% of the general population could be a steroid responder and this increases to almost 40% in patients of POAG. So any use of steroid with absolutely normal pressures and this at the moment makes a patient a glaucoma suspect. Our second patient is a 35-year-old male uh, who complains of diminution of vision in the right eye for a few months. He gives a history of uh, recurrent episodes of redness and pain in the right eye for a few years and has been treated with topical and oral steroids in the past on, uh, off and on for the same. Extensively investigated because of, uh, as you can guess, it would be a case of probably uveitis and was actually a B27 positive. On examination, the right eye's vision acuity is around 6, 12, and 6, left eye 6, 6, and 6. Pressures as of now are 18 and 14. Slit time examination, the right eye, as you probably see, uh, is a typical uveitic eye with posterior sinai case, occlusio pupillae, a complicated cataract, gonioscopy showing typical uveitic peripheral anterior sinai case. His discs, al although in both the eyes are okay, right, uh, no uh, anterior chamber inflammation as of now, few old vitreous cells in the right eye, but he is a glaucoma suspect because uveitis and glaucoma gives an incidence of almost 10 to 20 percent in acute cases and up to 40 percent in chronic cases. Trabeculitis related IOP spike in viral uveitis, postnatal schlossman, herpetic keratouveitis, very important risk factors. Chronic inflammation leading to debris in angle and HLA B27 and uh, sarcoidosis, eye well related, again are important. We see a lot of steroid responders in these patients as well. So the disease and the treatment both predispose this patient to glaucoma. So any UVIT, even with normal IOPs, when you see him, is a suspect and needs to be followed. Uh, many times we see patients, history, normal history doesn't reveal anything major. We examine the patient, see a suspicious disc, a suspicious perimetry, 
normal pressures, and then we go back and ask questions for low tension or normal tension disease, especially history of migraine, cluster headaches, small joint pains, rheumatoid arthritis, vasospastic disorders, Raynaud's phenomenon, history of nighttime antihypertensive, very important, reducing the ocular perfusion pressure at night, causing ocular hyperten hypertension, very important risk factor for vascular uh, dysregulation to the optic nerve. History of sleep apnea, history of excessive water drinking. You have patients who say, Can I, okay, I get up, have two liters of water immediately. That causes immediate circulatory overload in the eye, increase in IOP spike at that point of time, pressure damage. But when you see them in the OPD, pressures are fine, but an important history. History of certain breath holding exercises, yoga postures, upside down postures, all cause vascular compromise on the nerve and we need to pick up history. Non-progressive visual field defects with glaucomatous damage, normal IOPs could indicate a once a one event damage which could have happened, which could be a, a major hypervolumic shock, a, blood, a major accident or blood loss. These histories is not only important in diagnosing, but also is important in the form of treatment because of these are the things which we're going to ask our patient to avoid in the future. Very important to pick up. Our third case, a 50 year old, again, coming for a regular eye checkup, no history suggestive of any eye disease, no major systemic issues, vision's okay, slit lamp okay, gonio open, this healthy, but pressures are 24 and 23 on Goldman's. Is raised IOP a risk factor? We all know that IOP is the only modifiable risk factor. Various studies have shown us that decreasing IOP will decrease the progression of glaucoma. As pointed out earlier, the ocular hypertension treatment study clearly showed us that a 20% IOP drop reduces the conversion of open, uh, ocular hypertension to POAG by almost half. The early manifest glaucoma clearly tells us that every millimeter of mercury which you reduce will reduce the ch chance of progression by 10%. But does this mean we treat all ocular hypertensives? Almost 90% of eyes uh, who are untreated in the OHTS study did not progress. Do we need to treat all? No, we need to stratify the risk. We need to see who is at risk, who's less at risk, who's more at risk. An important risk factor in that is central corneal thickness. The ocul ocular hypertension treatment study clearly told us that subjects with decreased CCT were at higher risk of developing POAG. Uh, eyes with less than 555 microns were three times more likely to develop POAG compared to eyes more than 588. There is no formula for correcting IOP values. I repeat, there is no formula. We use it only as a guideline. We use it as a guideline to help us approximately tell us what our target pressures in a particular individual to be, whether we should be treated or not. But no IOL calculation formulae really work. So in this patient of ours, again, tests are normal, pressures are 24, 23. Let's take a scenario where his pachymetry is 490 micron. 490 micron with these pressures, irrespective of absence of any other risk factor, get our antennae up. We may not treat him, we may choose to observe him, but we are suspicious of him. The same patient, everything same, pachymetry of 600. We are more at ease because we know that the pachymetry of 600 is going to be more protective for him. So probably we follow him up as well, but not as close as what we'll follow up this particular individual. We see a variety of secondary glaucomas for something as simple as pigments on the endothelium uh, to a densely pigmented trabecular meshwork to pigments uh, on the uh, lens uh, equator, which we see in pigment dispersion syndrome. You may have patients who are coming to you completely asymptomatic, but you should remember that these patients at five or 10 years have a 15% chance of requiring medications for glaucoma. You may see them and they're absolutely normal, but they are glaucoma suspects. Patients of pseudo exfoliation, can have open angle, closed angle glaucomas. Risk of uh, their risk of developing glaucoma is almost 40 to 45 percent at five years after initial diagnosis of pseudo exfoliation. Very important risk factor. Any post uh, corneal transplant eye, irrespective of when you see him, pressures may be normal because of compromised angles, a variety of reasons. Always at risk of developing an IOP spike. Presence of a vascular occlusion when you see the patient, pressures being normal, have to follow this up for uh, looking at uh, various neovascularizations of the iris angle because these are patients whom we can catch if we are suspicious of them. So my take home message would be a meticulous history taking. A thorough slit lamp examination is very important as I cannot reemphasize that gonioscopy in every case, a management of primary angle closure suspects will be taken later. We need baseline investigations to compare with the future and risk stratification. Every patient has to be stratified who is more at risk, who's at less at risk and treat, observe accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mayab. Uh, you have uh, very nicely illustrated uh, how we need to uh, dig into and take the history of a patient to identify uh, the key factor, which is here, is the risk. It's not only the disc, suspicious disc or the increased IOP, but we have to look at the other risk factors also, uh, which may in the future uh, lead to increased intraocular pressure and optic nerve head damage. 
And another point I would like to add is the pupil re-examination, which is also very important uh, because uh, an asymmetry will also give us an idea of the optic nerve head status and also helps to rule out uh, any neurological causes. Any questions? While we okay, next we have Dr. Sahiba Sethi. Uh, she's a consultant at Arunodaya Desert Eye Hospital uh, here itself in Gurgaon, and uh, she was a uh, fellow here at uh, Strankanitrale where she did her glaucoma fellowship and she'll be talking about the obvious and the not so obvious changes in the optic nerve head in a glaucoma suspect. Good morning everyone. So without wasting much time, now why is optic disc examination so important? Well, in especially in glaucoma suspects, the optic disc and the nerve fiber layer changes usually occur first, much before the field defects uh, occur. The intraocular pressure and visual field assessment in, in themselves, they lack diagnostic sensitivity if you're not backing them up with a corresponding field, um, corresponding optic nerve defect. Now what I mean to say is careful examination of the optic disc allows us to detect early and preperimetric glaucoma. Now there are methods of clinical examination. You can use a direct ophthalmoscope, but then it's not very accurate. It lacks stereopsis. The gold standard of doing an optic nerve uh, measurement is uh, slit lamp biomicroscopy using non-contact lenses because it gives you a good stereoscopic examination and also allows you red-free uh, red light uh, examination for the RNFL. Now, if you're using a, a direct ophthalmoscope, use the Gross's technique uh, wherein a 5-degree aperture produces a circular spot of a diameter of 1.5 millimeters and this is how you assess the optic nerve head size. If you're using the slit lamp by a microscope, adjust the height of the slit lamp beam to coincide with the vertical edges of the optic disc and read the scale on the slit lamp. Now this has to always be multiplied by a correction factor depending on what uh, lens you're using. If it's plus 60, the correction factor is 1 and so on and so forth. Now, it's always a good practice to have um, a documentation of what you see. You should have a baseline documentation of your optic disc and serial, uh, serial photographs so that you can pick up early uh, progression. Now, stereo photographs are the gold standard, but if even if you don't have this in your practice or if it's uh, not affordable to your patient, optic disc diagrams is a very good uh, method of doing documentation. Now this is how a normal optic nerve looks like. The neuroretinal rim, which is basically uh, the amount of retinal nerve fiber layers that are contained in the optic disc that leave the eye, they follow a simple rule, which is the isn't rule, which means that the inferior is the thickest followed by superior nasal and temporal. The cup is basically the empty space within the optic disc and the horizontal cup is longer than the vertical cup. So any elongation in the vertical cup is what needs to be looked at suspiciously. Now there can, be uh, there can be a lot of physiological variations in a normal disc. The EUGS guidelines says that the use of CDR alone, the cup disc ratio to classify patients is not recommended and attention should be focused on the disc area. So if you see all of these three discs, the amount of rim area and the number of retinal nerve fiber layers that are contained in a small disc with a CD ratio of 0.2 is exactly equal to the number of nerve fiber layers that are passing through a large disc with a CD ratio of 0.8. So CDR in itself doesn't mean very much when you're not correlating it with the size of the disc. Neuroretinal rim, like I said, is the area between the cup and the disc margin. What is important over here is to delineate the cup margin. Now, usually follow the course of the vessels, the circumlinear blood vessels, they rest on the inner margin of the neuroretinal rim or the edge of the cup, like you say. Now, cup disc ratio is nothing but just a uh, ratio of the cup diameter to the vertical disc diameter. Horizontal is usually larger, vertical is lesser, so any elongation in the vertical CDR has to be looked at suspiciously. But again, I cannot emphasize more that the cup disc ratio is just a surrogate for the neuroretinal rim. It varies with disc size. A large cup can be normal for a large disc. On the other hand, a small cup may be abnormal for a small disc. CDR in itself doesn't mean very much. It can be fallacious. So Chandler and Grant, in their first edition way back in 1988, uh, 1986, they quoted, we have found that assessment of CDR is practically useless in management. The neuroretinal rim and the contour of this tissue is a cre uh, key parameter that needs to be assessed. So now let's look at these two examples. Which out of thi this do you think is normal? Any takers? The right one. Okay. 
So let's look at the first one. So this is a small cup. Like I said, a small cup can be abnormal for a small disc. So what you need to concentrate upon is the nerve fiber layer defect. You need to concentrate on the uh, retinal nerve, uh, neuroretinal rim, and you need to concentrate on the vessels. Over here, if you see that there is a absence of the uh, inferior neuroretinal rim, there is a very evident beta zone. So this is basically a pseudo normal glaucomatous mini cup. Now, when you look at this uh, uh, picture, a it is a large cup, but it's also a larger disc. And it's very uh, conveniently following the isn't rule. The rim looks very healthy. Th this is basically a pseudo glaucomatous cup in a large disc. So there are many, many signs in, uh, to pick up uh, glaucomatous optic disc. But for all practical purposes, you can very easily remember just these five rules, which can be remembered with a very simple mnemonic. Simple rules have no problems. You need to look at the size of the disc, the neuroretinal rim, hemorrhages, look for nerve fiber layer defects, and look for a peripaply atrophy. There are many other ancillary signs, but many just depend on CDR. So this is what I want to de-emphasize over here. So now I'll be elaborating just a few signs which you're more likely to find in a glaucoma suspect. Now, a notch can be very subtle in the beginning, but it's usually it's a combination of a couple of signs that gives you um, a more of a sensitivity to rule in glaucoma. So if you have a notch like in this one, there is an inferior notch over there, you will also have a corresponding inferior uh, nerve fiber layer defect. Then a saucerization, or what, we, what you say, a sloping disc, can be an early sign of glaucoma. So in this, there, there is basically a diffuse, shallow cupping that extends till the margin, but the normal neuroretinal rim co uh, uh, color is maintained even in the area of a focal saucerization. Nasalization of vessels doesn't mean very much. The first picture shows you a large disc with no glaucoma but nasalization. In the second picture, there is advanced glaucoma but no nasalization of vessels. Now, a concentric cup is basically where the neuroretinal rim has been lost somewhat everywhere, and it should be looked at uh, suspiciously. Now, disc asymmetry between the two eyes can mean either asymmetry in the size of the cup or the width of the NRR or the vessel course, peripapillary atrophy, either of these four. Now, an asymmetry of CDR, the cup disc ratio of more than 0.2 between the two eyes, when the disc size is similar and there is no anisometropia, has, uh, greatly increases the index of suspicion for glaucoma. Now again, like uh, Dr. Sujata mentioned, look out for trans hemorrhages. They're very rare and normal, and they can uh, very often precede RNFL defects, notching, or visual field defects. The bearing of circumlinear blood vessels, bayonetting, all these are signs that one needs to uh, consciously look out for. Now, retinal nerve fiber layer defects are better visualized at the posterior pole, especially at the vertical poles of the optic nerve head in an arcuate fashion. Green light is the best method to uh, diagnose it. Why? Because green light has a shorter wavelength, so it falls short of the red light, and all the uh, superficial structures, whether it's epiretinal membrane or trans hemorrhages, RNFLs, all the superficial uh, structures are better visualized under green light. So you can have uh, slit defects, or you can have wedge-shaped defects, or you can have diffuse RNFL loss, which is slightly more difficult to pick up clinically. Now, peripapillary changes can be of two types. The alpha zone atrophy, which is uh, the outer peripapillary atrophy, is present in almost all normal individuals. But the presence of a beta zone atrophy is what needs to alarm you a little, because it's more frequent and more extensive in patients with POAG and NTG. So uh, now le let's look at this example. So this is a disc. Now if you look at it objectively, now in the first look, you know the arrow is pointing towards a focal atrophy point. Then you, you can also see bearing of circumlinear blood vessels over there. There is also a laminar dot sign. So this is basically a very obviously a glaucoma uh, looking disc. Now what about this one? So again, like if you follow the mnemonic and look at it objectively, look at the size, the rim, hemorrhages, presence of any nerve fiber layer defects, any uh, peripapillary atrophy, you would pick up m multiple signs over here. There is an uh, inferior hemorrhage. It, it's probably an uh, average to a large size disc. And there is bipolar notching over here. Now what about this one? 
So if you're very quick in coming to a diagnosis in the first glance, you might just say this is a normal disc. But again, if you look at it very carefully, give it a few more minutes, you would know that there is a very evident inferior uh, disc hemorrhage over here, which is uh, a better demarcated in a red free filter examination. So Dr. Josh Jonas is also called Dr. Disc, and he had these three uh, rules which said, until proven otherwise, all glaucoma uh, suspects have disc hemorrhages, all glaucoma suspects have RNFL defects, and all myopes have glaucoma. So, now, these are very strong statements to make, but what he's trying to say is that in all glaucoma suspects, consciously look out for disc hemorrhages, consciously look out for RNFL defects, and always have a very high index of suspicion in all myopes. So what about this disc? So this is clearly not a very typical of a glaucomatous disc. This is most probably a congenital disc anomaly. These are again congenital disc anomalies. Now what about this one? The, is this a glaucomatous disc? It is a large disc. The CDR seems to uh, have increased in size vertically. But if you notice very carefully, there's something funny about the shape of the disc and also the course of the vessels. So this is basically a dysplastic disc. Now what about this one? This is again impossible to interpret clinically. This is a myopic disc in which you, uh, one needs to have a very high index of suspicion. Now myopic discs are usually tilted discs and these are tilted temporally. So it's very important that you delineate the disc uh, the temporal margin of the disc from the margin of the peripapillary atrophy. Now, for a glaucoma suspect, it's very important that one differentiates a glaucoma suspect from a completely non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Now, in a glaucoma suspect or a, a frank glaucoma, a glaucomatous disc, you'll have a typical loss of rim. You can have an enlarged cup. You, you can have a beta zone peripapillary atrophy. There will be no rim pallor. And you can support it with typical glaucomatous field defect findings. But in a pseudo-glaucomatous atrophy, atrophy, the NRR will be pale. You can assess the color of the intact rim in all the quadrants of the disc. They will be uh, supported with typical neuroophthalmic field defects. And you can also check the color vision just to be sure. Now what about these discs? Do they look glaucomatous? So they're unusually too pale. So always consider a uh, complete clinical picture when in doubt. Now, what about this one? So this is a patient who has a BCVA of 6'6 six, six in the right eye, 4 by 60 in the left eye. The left eye disc is pale. Over here, the giveaway is actually the right eye. So this, is, um, this example is basically given just to stress that examining both the eyes are very important. So in the right eye, there's a small crowded disc. So this is most probably an NAION of the left eye. Now, this is a suspicious looking disc again with a normal IOP and a normal automated perimetry. Is it a neurological disc pallor? So, there is a very striking um, uh, temporal pallor over here of the NRR. But is it glaucomatous or is it neurological? So, again, the subtle sign to be picked up over here, which can be missed easily, is the superior notching. So, the RNFL. Uh, OCT confirms that there is a superior RNFL thinning along with the notch. Now, all these kind of uh, discs, whether it's coloboma, optic disc pit, or tilted disc, these are all disc suspects, and you will not be penalized in over-investigating these patients with a perimetry. Of course, I don't need to emphasize the fact that RNFL OCT has no role in, uh, in uh, any of these sort of morphological uh, discs. So all of these discs need to be evaluated and investigated if you cannot uh, interpret them clinically. So just a few clinical pearls to take home. Always, it's a good practice to draw diagrams because it helps in developing skill for evaluation. Also, brings down the cost for your patients for not having a photograph taken every time. Document the progression of um, uh, with ONH photos, if possible. The diameter of the disc has to be taken in account, into account whenever you're assessing the disc with a CD ratio. Trans hemorrhages, defects in the RNFL uh, need to be consciously looked out for. And always mention the dimensions of the contour of the NRR, not the color. That's important in glaucoma. Disc asymmetry needs to be looked out for when comparing both the eyes. And always keep the differential diagnosis in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sahiba, for beautifully illustrating all the disc suspects. And uh, examination of the disc is a gold standard. 
So uh, next we move on to, uh, I would call upon Dr. B. Shanta, who's the Director of Glaucoma Services at Shankar Netrale, Chennai. And uh, she's our mentor and guide. And uh, most of the challenging glaucomas do become very simple in her hands for us. So she'll be talking about uh, the visual fields and oh. the dilemmas you uh, face when you perform the visual fields in glaucoma suspects. Uh, meanwhile, any questions. questions are there for the previous speakers? test and even that is time consuming for both the patient and the attender so we try to find out if there is any correlation between water drinking and uh, agreement between the water drinking test and the diurnal variation test what we f I mean uh, in water drinking the patient fluid fast for two hours then we used to give 10 ml of k uh, per kg body weight of water to the patient and uh, they had to drink it within 5 to 15 minutes so we had taken uh, day diurnal variation test from 8 to 3 p.m. at two hour intervals. Then at 3 o'clock, we gave them this volume of water to consume. Then at 15 minute intervals, we had taken the eye pressure measurements for about one hour till it returned to baseline. And then we made a comparison if there was any correlation between the diurnal variation test for the same patient and the, if the uh, water drinking, whatever values we had got. We found that the correlation was good. But then to use it as any test to be used as a substitute, the agreement should be good. But the agreement was not good for the IOP peak and fluctuations. It was uh, good for mean IOP. So because of that, we did not use the water drinking as a substitute. But then it does give a good information about a patient's short-term IOP profile. More recent studies are suggesting that it is the nighttime uh, IOP which is peaking more than the daytime IOP. Uh, do you have any idea with your studies about this? So is it like uh, in progressing patients, when we find that the IOP is right within the target IOP, should we go in for a nighttime DVT? In some places they have done a 24 hour uh, IOP measurement. We had only used an office IOP measurement between 8 to 4. It is normally between uh, the early morning IOP which peaks between 5 to 7, which is corresponding to the cortisol increase. Nighttime generally there's a dip in the IOP and some people have measured like uh, nocturnal blood pressure measurements as well as the IOP measurements. Wait, wait, wait. Hmm? I'm sorry for this delay. It seems to be happening everywhere at this meeting. <laughs> so I'm basically to going to talk about uh, pitfalls in perimetry when you get confused as to whether this patient has uh, glaucoma or not. We all know that uh, you need to know Anderson's criteria to designate a patient's uh, visual field defect as glaucomatous or non-glaucomatous. I won't go into the detail. But when you are presented with a visual field test, you have to decide whether there is a field defect or not, and if it is glaucomatous. Is this defect glaucomatous? You can see that uh, the glaucoma hemifield test is outside limits, and uh, there are sufficient number of points, non-edge points, which satisfy the Anderson's criteria but you have to correlate it with the optic disc. And you can see here that there is an inferior notch, there is peripapillary atrophy, which corresponds with the inferior notch, and there's a nerve fiber layer defect as well. So this is a glaucoma defect. Is this a glaucoma defect? It's pretty bizarre. You have a, a dense defect inferiorly, and with just this test alone, can we say whether there is a defect, whether there is a glaucoma, whether it is some other problem? Again, correlated with the disc, you can see that this disc is a uh, fairly large disc with the uh, normal cup disc ratio, the no obvious defect. 
So this patient had a language issue. She was a Bengali and the test uh, was explained in English by the perimetrist. So once a uh, translator came and uh, told the patient about how to perform the test, the results were much better. Is this defect glaucomatous? It's unusual to have such a dense defect in the periphery of the field. So uh, this was found to be a lid artifact and after taping the lid and then going a ahead uh, with repeating the test, you can see that the test uh, result is much better. I think we all know what this is. This is a lens rim artifact. And uh, once you correct with contact lenses or use full aperture lenses, then this uh, defect disappears. What about this? This is unusual. You might at face value think that this is a nasal step, but a nasal step doesn't cross the horizontal meridian. So this is called by, uh, caused by a cylindrical lens rim artifact when you use frosted slides to correct the refractive error for the patients. So it's better to use a full aperture lens, and we published this in the Clinical and Experimental uh, Optometry Journal. Now this is very unusual. You can see the, this is a tilted optic disc in a myopic patient with a very large area of peripapillary atrophy, but this is bizarre. It doesn't correlate at all. And you can see that the refractive error here has been entered as plus one. Once the correct pr prescription was uh, in place, you can see that the uh, report is much better with just an enlarged blind spot which correlates with the disc appearance. This again is a little b bizarre, isn't it? It looks as if this patient has two blind spots. So what happened was that the perimetrist had entered the wrong eye. For in the patient details, for left eye, she had entered right eye, and this is why you had this fallacy. So once if this was corrected, you have a much better result. Now this is a patient with a central sequel sc scotoma. So what do you do in this situation? You can see that the patient has a lot of uh, fixation errors and the foveal threshold is pretty low. So the patient has a macular pathology. So you can use a large diamond in place and then uh, get a better delineation of what the actual uh, defect is. This again, what kind of a defect is this? Do we need to see this patient's very advanced glaucoma? Both the perimeters and the patient were fast asleep. So once they woke up and the thing was corrected, you can see that the uh, re result is much better. So that's something that you have to look out for. Now this is something that we often see. You have a defect which doesn't appear to be uh, very advanced, but you have a central point which is very close to the fixation. So in this case, you have to repeat the uh, test with a 10-2, which shows that uh, the central points are much more uh, uh, affected in detail. And you may miss this if you just do a 24-2 a test alone. So the latest Humphrey uh, series, you have the two combined in the 24-2C so that you have a tighter grid of uh, test points tested in the central visual field. Is this defect glaucomatous? No, it's not as uh, it was described earlier because this defect co corresponds with the coloboma of the retina. Now this was a very bizarre defect. You can see that there's a superior notch with a nerve fiber layer defect. Here you see a tilted disc with an inferior notch with a nerve fiber layer defect. And this corresponds with the visual field also. So this patient, we uh, did a daytime DABT and we thought nerve fiber layer defect is there, corresponding visual field uh, defects are there, so it's better to treat the patient. But however, on glowing through the literature, we found that there is something called situs inverses of the optic disc, which presents like this. And uh, this was very interesting. After this, we decided to discontinue the treatment and follow the patient closely. Over a period of four to five years, there has been no progression at all. So a fa false labeling here would have been disastrous for the patient. This was a patient who was uh, seen elsewhere, and uh, these were the baseline disc photographs taken, and the patient uh, underwent visual field examination. And based on this visual field treatment had been started. But you can see that this is a typical chloral leaf pattern, and when the visual field test was repeated, the patient has done much better. But there are patients who have prolonged learning curves, and if this continues over four or five fields, you have to switch over to progressive optic disc photographs or uh, use imaging. And you can see that in this patient, there was a significant uh, difference in the disc size, which accounted for the cup disc asymmetry. So don't get carried away by that. Is this defect glaucomatous? It's unusual to have a nasal defect which is not close to the horizontal meridian. So this was a 24-2 examination. When we repeated with 30-2, the defect was, uh, did not really correspond to a pattern that you see in glaucoma. And on imaging, we found that it was a pie in the sky neurological defect. Now this is uh, coming to progression. For lack of time, I have got not gone into details. Sometimes we do an overview analysis and you can see that this patient, while following up, 
the defect was increasing, pattern deviation shows increase the number of points which have been affected, but this suddenly disappeared. How did this happen? This patient had a posterior subcapsular cataract which was responsible for these defects and once the cataract surgery was done, the defects magically disappeared. So in conclusion, a detailed history is important, detailed baseline examination, identify the risk factors for glaucoma, do a good correlation with the disc and fields, identify unusual features for both the disc and fields, make informed decisions in each individual based on current evidence and don't hesitate to take a second opinion if there are unusual features. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shanta, for uh, nicely explaining uh, that the visual field examination is complementary to the clinical and structural tests. We should identify the artifacts, the non-glaucomatous causes, identify the subtle changes, and choose the testing strategies accordingly, and also address the patient's apprehension regarding the procedure, probably wake them up before doing the fields. So next, uh, I'll be talking about the imaging pitfalls. Any questions for Dr. Mike. 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 A 64 year old male patient with uh, diabetes and hypertension. He has, uh, at first presentation, he had uh, pressures of 50 and 58, right and left side. CCT was normal, angles were pretty open. Then IOP was this much, what do we do? Definitely doesn't seem to be like a glaucoma suspect. 50, 58 pressures in primary open angle glaucoma for presentation is slightly rare. So more chances of it being something else so more important is to look at angles very closely again. Angle closure could be a major cause of such high pressures. And definitely a secondary glaucoma like a steroid for, for some reason, which has been going on, should be used. Uh, if none of these things are then pressures are this high, you obviously need to control pressures first with medications, investigate him, see what is his pressures coming down to, and then take it from there. But pressures of 50 and 58, yeah, so 50-58 needs to be treated. So you have to treat him. Of course, there's no doubt about it. 50-58, you have to treat. So let's look at the imaging uh, pitfalls in a glaucoma suspect. So when do we image a glaucoma suspect? We need the structural changes to discriminate between normal and glaucoma and to detect either progression or conversion of the uh, suspect to glaucoma. Uh, and often, as we just saw, the fields may be either just normal all the time, like in ocular hypertensives, or the patient may not be feeling very great about doing the fields, or uh, due to some reasons may not be ab able to do the fields. So uh, OCT is currently the best available digital imaging instrument we have, especially according to the WGA also. But it does have its pitfalls, which we should consider. Now this is a typical case where the OCT has been really helpful. If you see the discs, uh, it is a little suspicious, but the f uh, this photo is not picking up the RNFL changes, maybe a loss of striations in the left eye and a n asymmetry in the cup disc ratio. There's a slight asymmetry in the size also. Uh, uh, so field defect is definitely present uh, so in the superior nasal part near the horizontal meridian, but the OCT beautifully illustrates the RNFL thinning in the left eye, both superiorly and inferiorly. But the picture is always not that, and here it beautifully illustrates progression uh, and conversion also. Uh, but the picture is also uh, never that rosy always. And uh, majority, um, up to 46% can have artifacts. But 80% of the time, these artifacts are obvious. However, uh, we need to identify these facts. And so once we look at the scan, it throws us a lot of information. We really don't know where to look initially. And our eye goes at the colors we see daily on the road. That is the red and the green and maybe the yellow. So uh, we are sometimes misled by these colors and we have the red, green and even the white disease. 
and this is a, a typical example where a part of the picture is still missing and the, the patient has been started on treatment. So we can see the right eye RNFL is normal, left eye has some red areas of thinning but and uh, pressure is borderline and the patient is on timolol, has been started on timolol and here still we need to fit in many parts of the puzzle and you can see one thing in the lower scan you can see a little decentration of the scan here which may be responsible for this thinning we don't know so uh, this is another example of the uh, time domain OCT you can see the average thickness of the RNFL is decreasing from 85 to 74 which can quantify as well its progression it's thinning but then there's the catch it's the signal strength you see it's seven here and four here so uh, you don't know it may be progression or it may be an artifact and uh, if I tell you here you can see the deviation map here with increasing thickness th uh, thinning of the RNFL is it progression would you start treatment in this patient it is a dissuspect but actually it's the RNFL thickness deviation map of a normal eye which is obtained by varying the signal strength so signal strength is one of the key factors you should look at and when you look at the same patient which I showed you earlier these are the two scans the patient had and the uh, treating doctor had marked this uh, change in the RNFL thickness and you can also see the how the normal uh, classification has now changed to abnormal here but if you look carefully the signal strength is four here and it's just one here and what I did I repeat the scan and the RNFL grows back it seems and uh, we also need to look at the uh, macula at the ganglion cell analysis and what do we see here the left eye absolutely normal and the right eye shows areas of thinning as well as thickening and the patient has a CNVM also so we need to take into account these uh, pitfalls which can misguide us sometimes so can we compare the data from the earlier time domain with the uh, uh, cirrus now uh, we cannot compare the RNFL values in these two machines because all the machines have different databases, ethnicities and the way they segment also is different. So we need to take that account. If you have whatever machine you have, just follow up the patient with that machine, that would be adequate. Now how can we correct the changes, this uh, issues in signal strength? See, once a patient goes for OCT, mostly uh, the gonio and the applanation has been done and already they might have some pre-existing ocular surface disease also and uh, you can because of this get low signal strength and all you need is a drop of lubricants and it improves the signal strength and also changes the classification and the RNFL thickness values which you get here and same for the macula you can see this propeller like sign which is thinning but not very typical shape of glaucoma here but when you add lubricants here and repeat the scan it just disappears so what about dilation now the newer machines we are able to image without dilating the patient but if you want reproducibility because why you want to image you want to follow up the patient it's not a one-time procedure you not want to look for any conversion or progression so for reproducibility especially in the presence of a cataract it's good to dilate and do the OCT uh, this is another issue which can come up with OCT here's this patient with a large disc uh, disc suspect uh, this you can see on the left side absolutely normal Whereas on the right side, you can see, uh, apart from a poor signal strength of one, you can also have areas of missing data, areas of uh, thickening here. And if you see at this distant map, you can see values going from 0 to 120. 0 is never possible in OCT. That is always a red flag. Your antennas should be up. And similarly, uh, very thick values are also are not uh, usually seen. And you should always look at the B extracted B scan here where the segmentation has actually gone haywire and part of the scan is also missing or truncation and all this has led to the values of 0 and 120 in the range of 120s also so clearly you need to put lubricants and repeat your scan guide the person who's doing the scan and this was segmentation error very gross and here it can be very subtle also if you could see this on first image you can see an RNFLD here but here the segmentation has included this RNFL defect and may give you normal values and the field also is normal so you may actually miss a glaucoma and you may something which is called green disease so you need to be very careful when you look at the segmentation uh, again as I told showed uh, the earlier patient scan decentration can give you these kinds of peaks whereas actually when it is centered it may be a normal scan 
And here, so now we are wiser, we look at the signal strength, it is good. We look at the centration here, which is very good. We look at our B scan here, which is good here, good segmentation here. But here it's gone a little wavy and here the uh, optic nerve head is actually missing. And what you see here is a motion artifact, the patient is moving the eyes. And when repeated here, you can see the change in the RNFL thickness values as well as the classification. And uh, this is another blink artifact where, again, the part of the data is missing because it has not been captured as the patient is blinking. And here is the calculation circle. And it involves part of that, which again leads to these values of uh, 0. And again, when we repeat it, you can see the difference in the RNFL thickness which you get and the classification. And this is, again, important because you want to follow up the patient, not just a one-time uh, procedure. And a simple helping hand by a person who's uh, performing uh, the OCT can uh, help deal with all of these artifacts, actually. And now we mostly tend to look at these values, which are just derived from this circle here, which is just one circle, whereas what we are capturing is 6 by 6 millimeter of data. And we need to look at these th uh, RNFL thickness as well as deviation maps also, which give us a whole lot of information from the whole cube. And here you can see, you can see a nice uh, RNFL thinning here in this, uh, both these uh, maps. And here also, although it picks it up, but as the averaging effect occurs, it ultimately becomes normal here, right? So you need to, these actually maps give, sometimes they give information before the uh, clock hour and the quadrant maps. So vitreous can also play a lot of tricks. Uh, you can have PVDs, and here it is sitting right on top of the calculation circle, again giving a value of zero, and we may think that the thinning is due to glaucoma if we don't look at the scans here and the thickness and the deviation maps here. And once the patient moves the eye, the floater moves absolutely normal. Uh, vitreous can also cause traction on the retinal nerve fiber layer, causing a pseudo thickening, and when the traction is released, it will cause a pseudo thinning and the difference may appear as if it's progressing. So again, but the patient is normal. So macula again can have pathologies which can misguide you. Another confounder is myopia and uh, it can be falsely classified as abnormal by OCT as Dr. Sahib earlier told and because these discs are tilted, torted, have a large PPA, large axial length and main problem here is you can see which one has glaucoma. All of them myo have myopia, right? And myopia comes as a whole spectrum, different shapes and sizes and tilts of the disc. So this is a myopic disc with, uh, with only the shifting of the peaks here, whereas there is no thinning. And since it doesn't correspond to the normative data, you may get red values in your scan, whereas here you actually have a retinal nerve fiber layer defect, corresponding visual field defect. This is glaucoma with myopia. This is again a suspect, the patient, I haven't put the fields here, has superior nasal defects bilaterally and thinning here, so it's still a uh, suspect here. And here, as again Dr. Sahib earlier told, you have uh, the scan circle falling on the areas of the PPA and the segmentation going haywire again. S and so some mac uh, myopic, uh, we say that in myopes you can try and image the macula, but some, uh, in some cases even that's not possible. So uh, another is the split bundles, which is a physiological condition where you, the machine will classify the area of between the split as red, whereas actually it's a normal disc, a normal variation. Retinoschisis can uh, mislead you many times because it's a condition where the RNFL defects keep appearing and disappearing and the retin, uh, the schisis keeps uh, uh, resolving and ca coming back again. So you can have areas of thickening and thinning which can kind of misguide you. Here you can see the white disease where it is appearing very thick and when you do the scan, whereas actually it's an area of thinning which was in 2014. So which part of the scan should I look at? So the answer is all the parts are there and they, are, they give you uh, very valuable information and so you should have your checklist ready and I'll just have the checklist by now. So first is the patient details. It should not be his brother's scan. And uh, the signal strength, the scan centration, the on fast image, whether it's uniform, the segmentation from the B scans, the thickness maps, the deviation, the TISNET curve, and the quadrant and the clock hours. Any abnormal uh, values in any of these should give you a suspicion, and you should go back and scan the patient. So now we have our checklist here. So the signal strength is, strength is good. The uh, uh, so the circle is nicely aligned, segmentation is good, so the patient has glaucoma, right? 
This is the disc of the patient. Patient is on glycerol acetazolamide. This is a disc, it's pallor because patient is of IIH, had papilledema, which then resolved and it led to pallor. And uh, again, this is one of the fallacies of OCT. You cannot diagnose glaucoma based on OCT. You can just diagnose the RNFL thinning and then uh, correlate clinically what is the cause of the thinning. And you can miss disc hemorrhages in OCT. And sometimes RNFL defects can be there, but they can be due to other causes like here or sometimes vitamin B12 deficiency. That's another example. Uh, just going back, uh, touching upon PACS, the only thing is when you image a patient, do it in dim light because you can see how the angle has opened up when the OCT was done in uh, dim light as, uh, in bright light as compared to dim light. And this can give you a false uh, sense of security if you do it in a bright light. So uh, with that, uh, I will conclude by saying that uh, we should look at imaging, whether it's real or artifact, glaucometers, non-glaucometers, we should confirm and we should always correlate. And again, I invite uh, you all to the cataract catalyst, which is on 6th and 7th of June, which will have glaucoma-related cataract issues also uh, covered. Thank you. So next, I call upon uh, Dr. Manish Pandey, who's the Director of Glaucoma Ser Services at uh, Ratan Jyoti Eye Hospital, Gwalior. And he'll be talking about how to manage a suspect once we have diagnosed him. Uh, 74 year old and she would not come to the hospital because she had to do a, a visual field. She was again a suspect, not a, a diagnosed glaucoma. So she was very happy doing the OCT but then you need to tell the patient also that uh, it is uh, not the complete test we are doing. We need to do a structural as well as a functional test. If in any way the functional test is not possible, uh, you can rely on, you can, there's no other option. You have to do a structural test and you have to follow up but then you have to keep the limitations in mind and also inform the patient that you are uh, missing out on important functional data here. And I mean, that lady, after seeing a normal OCT, she was convinced to do a visual fields in the next visit. So. Uh, 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 where, the, where is the progression? And are you sure it's progression? Yeah, no, first of all, that's what I told. First of all, if you're seeing changes in overall in the OCT and clinically, if it's correlating with a disc hemorrhage and a pressure of uh, 26, you will treat the patient, right? But if uh, the pressure is 12 and uh, you are seeing changes in the OCT, you need to confirm also where is the change, whether it's in a location typical of glaucoma, how much is this change? If it's three of, uh, if it's five microns, it's not important. If at least should be more than at least 10 microns uh, of uh, RNFL thickness change. And glaucoma is a forgiving disease. You can again wait a couple of months, rescan the patient, and then try to convince the patient to do a functional test also, see what other risk factors are, like pseudo exfoliation, other eye has glaucoma. Then uh, you have to, like a treatment for glaucoma is more customized rather than giving you a recipe. <laughs> So I'll be talking about managing a glaucoma suspect as an evidence-based algorithm. We know some of these suspects may progress to glaucoma, but right now we are only concerned about suspects and whether we need to treat these suspects at any stage. What defines the treatment of these suspects is the risk of progression. We need to know whether there is a risk of progression for that suspect. Now risk can be quantified. If you look at a 65-year-old male, IOP of 20, 34 and 23, angle closure, one eye has an advanced glaucoma, other eye's disc is healthy. He has a certain risk of progression in the left eye. Look at a 44-year-old male, IOP is only 22, open angles, suspicious looking optic disc, but very strong family history. So he has a, probably a risk which is a little lesser than the first one. Look at a 50-year-old male, IOP is only 25, IOP is higher, open angles, healthy rims, no family history, no risk factors. That will have a lower risk. So you have to quantify the risk among these different subgroup of patients to find out what is the amount of risk for each of them. A lot of speakers have spoken about all these risk factors, and when we collate all of them, we need to take an informed decision, treat or not to treat. 
That's the decision that we need to take. There are three options before a clinician. Now we can treat if the progression occurs. So that is the number one. We'll treat only if the progression occurs, so that's the first step. The number two is we'll treat only if the risk of progression is very, very high. So there is a certain risk of progression. And we find that certain risk is high or the damage is likely with the current intraocular pressures or the risk factors overwhelmingly favor a treatment. We will treat it because of the risk. The third is that we treat everybody, that we take all the suspects and we need to treat it. So we'll not go into the third one. We are deciding between the second, first and the second ones. We also have to quantify the cost of therapy, the cost of therapy to the quality of the life. That's what we are talking about the patient. But there are two other factors, the patient's own fear of going blind and the physician's desire. We also don't want to harm the patient. So these two, all these factors have to be combined to come up to a conclusion whether we want to treat the patient or not. The risk can be defined. It could be 5%, 10%, 20% over a period of a few years, four years or five years. But for the patient that's sitting in front of you, you don't know that risk. If you are not treating, because there is no disease at all, there are no visual field effects at all, why do you want to treat? So you need to take a balance between uh, treating and not treating. I'll come to uh, specific examples. Take about angle closure suspects. We know that the angles are appositionally close in around 180 degrees. The pressures are normal at this point. There are no disc and field changes. So everything appears to be normal. There's a little amount of angle closure there. So what is the risk? The risk when we are thinking about is a conversion. Is a conversion to a primary angle closure or an angle closure glaucoma. That's the presence of synechias or raised intraocular pressure. And the risk is that indicated that the risk of a progressive disease outweigh the risk and side effects of treatment. So should we treat it? What is the risk that it converts? We don't want to treat all PSEs. The problem here is that there's a large number of angle closure disease patients. If you look at, it's around 27.66 million. And PSEs, the top one, constitutes a majority of these subjects. This is nearly the population of Delhi. So if you look, do we need to treat everybody? We can't treat everybody. The resources are going to be overwhelmingly stretched if you start treating every PSCS. What is the risk of progression? By study by Ravi Thomas et al. found that around 22% patients progressed to primary angle closure, but none of them developed an angle closure attack, and none of them developed a PSCG, and there were no biometric risk factors that were identified. So laser iridotomy for every subject with PSCS is questionable. We should not be treating everybody, probably. Because of the large affected population and the low risk of progression, we don't know the natural history, the evidence, and we need the budget also is not there. The PI for PACS remains a prophylactic procedure and it is justified with a careful patient selection where we want to do it and becomes a no for everybody. Beside family history of angle closure, yes. A fellow eye of acute angle closure, yes. There are some retinal issues, patient requires frequent dilatation, yes. Follow-up is probably not possible. Probably at that situation also you can decide. And you find certain risk factors that there is a very, very patchy sort of pigmentation of the angle, as you can see in the picture, that possibly, yes, we can decide for a laser iridotomy at that point. If you are deciding not to treat, document and follow-up. Follow-up is very, very important. Document the angles, especially for any sinecures, measure the intraocular pressure, explain the follow-up, ensure that the patient comes regularly to you. You can decide six monthly to an early follow-up and then decide at what stage you need to treat. Coming to ocular hypertension, we have already discussed a part of it. But supposing there's a pressure 23, 25 open angles, the OHTS has already been discussed. I'm not going into the details, so but basically it, it divided patients with the pressures of 24 to 32 into two groups, a medication group and an observation group. Observation group had no treatment. The medication group had a certain amount of treatment to lower the intraocular pressures. And the final point, uh, point that we were discussing is the conversion to POAG, or uh, open angle glaucoma. Now we know that uh, some of the speakers have told that there is a certain amount of risk if we don't treat. So that is the risk is around 9.5%, and the risk for conversion falls to around 4.4% if you are trying to treat it. So definitely over a period of uh, four or five, five years, we can see that there is a, the risk is reduced with treatment. So to treat, because early treatment can reduce the conversion of POG, we can be very justified to do it, but do we need to treat everybody? Go to no treat, 90% in both the groups, even if you're treating or you're not treating, 90% of them actually do not convert. So why do we need to treat everybody? We don't need to treat everybody. Or we need to define a certain factors that we treat somebody at risk. Also need to factor the cost of treatment. And we also know that there is no correct formula to correct for IOP for CCT in these situations, as speakers have told. If you look into the left side of the picture and the up, I can see, see that the, as the uh, central corneal thickness is on the lower side and the intraocular pressures are on the higher side, you can see the highest risk of conversion in the OHDS. 
if you look closely, that there's something called as a number needed to treat. What they found out is, is that if you treat everybody, for every 20 patients, 20 cases of ocular hypertension that are treated for five years, we can prevent one case of progression if we treat everybody. So we don't need to treat everybody to get that one person out of the 20. So there were certain factors that were identified to find out the risk of progression that have already been discussed, including age, high intraocular pressure, thinner central cornea, larger vertical cup to this ratio, and a higher PST. The European glaucoma prevention study also randomized the patients to dorsalamide or no treatment. The NNT with, with this was one case of progression as compared to 143. So we don't need to treat everybody. But here, the int higher intraocular pressure at baseline in both the groups was associated with progression. So finally, how do we take it to our patient? Practically, if you find that intraocular pressures are very, very high, certain situations, all the risk factors remain the same, and the intraocular pressures are very high, overwhelmingly high beyond 30, then you find that possibly there is a risk for progression, and possibly we need to treat. And pressures are not very high, 23, 24, possibly we can observe. That's somewhere in between that we need to take the risk and benefit assessment, whether we need to treat or follow up that patient very, very closely. Compare this, the risk factors, to, to that, the other one, the benefit to the patient, because of the low incidence for glaucoma, the age and the life expectancy, whether treatment is actually benefiting the patient and the burden of therapy to take a final decision whether we need to treat that ocular hypertensive or not. There are certain amount of risk calculators available in the market that will give you certain amount of risk over a period of few years, what's the amount of risk? As somewhere around 10% we can see there. Now, they are basically used because we as ophthalmologists tend to underestimate the risk. If you have a patient sitting in front of you, you'll say that possibly the risk is less. But when you calculate it with these calculators, the risk is actually much more higher as compared to what you clinically estimate them. But the caveat here is that the subject should be very similar to the OHTS inclusion-exclusion criteria to these studies. That is sometimes not possible with the patient sitting in front of you. May work for many people, but for that individual patient, you're not very sure that calculator is actually working or is giving you some information, the patient is converting or not, we are not sure about it at that point. So not every patient with ocular hypertension should be treated, determine an individual risk of progression. We find out all these factors that have been discussed, look at all those risk factors, vein occlusion, disc hemorrhage, myopia, age, that have been discussed, and then decide whether we need to treat that patient or follow up that patient. A suspicious looking optic disc, I take at this point that there's possibly no visual field defects at this point. Now, there may be some amount of physiological cupping, anomalous disc, everything else is normal. But they are very, very unlikely to be associated with a very high intraocular pressures or progression. So these are very sort of physiological, or abnormal sort of discs that we have seen, that uh, Saiba has also shown. Have a baseline documentation. You can include a disc photographs for that. Okay, you can have a baseline uh, visual fields also. That will show some defects, but they're not likely to progress. And have a careful follow-up with them. Don't treat. A suspicious looking optic disc with a cup disc ratio of around 0.7, then intraocular pressure is recorded as 22 with aplanation. The visual fields have been done. The ophthalmologists have noted that everything is outside normal limits. The test is done reliably and pattern deviation is present and he decided to treat. And you can see that the medication has to be given. But look at all those factors and then decide whether you actually need to treat that patient or not. Just a physiological problem with a little borderline pressures. So don't base a diagnosis and therapy based on results of a single test. Look at the disc, look at the visual fields, look at the OCT, look at the family history, look at other risk factors, keep the red and green disease that Mona has described, have a step ladder approach to treatment, keeping all these factors, and then decide whether we need to treat that patient or follow up that patient. A single test is not going to define whether we need to treat them or not. So in a patient with whom the probability or the prior probability of having glaucoma as measured by clinical examination is low, the imaging studies alone are unlikely to lead to the diagnosis of glaucoma. No test has been shown to be superior to qualitative evaluation of the optic disc photographs. So be very careful. Optic disc photographs are very, very important, especially in case of suspects. We can use, as Mona has discussed, about the OCT for predicting a progression in a subset of these suspects. But the optic disc photographs are very important. Take an example. Now, this was a young boy, around 26-year-old male, had a trauma in the right eye around 10 years back, has an angle recession in the right eye, and you can see the nerve fiber layer defects. Pressures are around 17 and 16, central corneal thickness is normal. If you look at the OCD, there is a certain amount of defects that you can see. The visual fields are showing a little, certain little amount of scatter. But I don't feel that this patient requires a treatment. He requires a closer follow-up. I'll call him, I'll call him first time he had come at six months, and probably I need to follow it up over a period of time. I'll not treat, like to treat this patient, despite some evidence that he has a glaucoma in the right eye that is probably in the past. The last thing is the risk factors. Look at the family history. 
If you have no other abnormality after a comprehensive examination, do a disc photographs, have an annual check, look at other factors that Maya was discussed into, look especially at the look of steroids. Now we should be humble that we still don't know the full effects of intraocular pressure and its fluctuation on the human eye. Finally, do no harm. Decide whether treatment is of benefit to the patient. Keep in mind the life expectancy and the comorbidities and that is with a reasonable certainty, without use of anticipated treatment, the patient is likely to get worse, then only treat. Now treat if the, the optic, no, I'm sorry for the spelling, the optic nerve deterioration is evident. There are subtle optic disc and retinal nerve fiber near abnormalities that are identified over a period of time. You see new visual field defects or the patient has a very high intraocular pressure and nerve uh, damage is expected. That these are the options that we need to take if we are to start thinking about doing a treatment. From the place from where I come, this is a rural truth. The distance to pharmacy is very, very important. People travel for long dis hours, half days to get that bottle of Timolol. So 9% travel more than two hours, 29% more than 10 kilometers. Some of my patients travel half of the day to get that bottle of Timolol from the hospital. So availability of drugs is very important. Decide whether you actually need to treat or not, or you're trying to just give a bottle to the patient and finish off. And if treatment is suggested, minimal IP lowering therapy, especially PG analogs, please don't base any glaucoma surgery based on suspicion alone. Have a close monitoring with structural and or functional testing depending on the risk profile for the patient. If it's a low risk, probably an yearly follow-up or from moderately to high risk, probably a little earlier, six months could be done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey, for uh, nicely giving us uh, guidelines, very comprehensive guidelines for identifying the risk factors and following up the patients. So uh, I'd just like, uh, are there any questions for uh, the speakers? I think. Okay, so it's good to have the synopsis here. So I'll, I'll sum up here. Uh, so in this IC, we defined, uh, it's good to define uh, a glaucoma suspect. Uh, where when you're defining a person as a glaucoma suspect, you're labeling him for life. So you should be very clear what type of glaucoma suspect is there. Like Dr. Sujata told, there can be multiple classifications. And you should identify the risk factors and explain to the patient why he is a glaucoma suspect. Nothing can replace a very good history like Dr. Manwala told and a very thorough clinical examination like Dr. Sahiba told. Uh, examination of the optic nerve head is gold standard and uh, nothing can replace that. Structural and functional tests are complementary to the clinical examination, give us important information and uh, they have the limitations in view of the artifacts which can occur since uh, they are operator and patient dependent. And uh, the follow-up should be uh, very important. It should not be a one-time examination. And the patient should be explained his condition very carefully. And it's basically, like I told earlier, not a recipe, but it has to be customized to the patient profile. So any questions? Yeah, so uh, that shows it's related to, it's usually seen in Cirrus uh, OCT. Uh, it's basically when you put your cursor on that, it just tells that the uh, in the patient's uh, values uh, correspond to some values in the normative database. They are very close to that. So the classification which you're getting is a little, maybe a little different. So you should uh, monitor and interpret the values which you're getting accordingly. Uh, you, yeah, you have... Uh, it's not wrong. So then what you can do is you repeat uh, when you at follow up when you repeat, you you are likely to get a little more variation in those patients. That's what it means. If you look at the manual of the OCT, it points out that you, if you put your cursor there, it will give you a red flag that it's close to the value of the patient. The profile of the patient is close to some uh, values in the normative database. So in that case, uh, you can't change that, right? So you have to just follow up uh, the patient carefully and interpret the results as to how his progression. There may be more variability in those cases. That's what uh, uh, is.
yeah it's uh, it's basically uh, uh, for that disk size the machine does not have much values in the normative database its own reference database to compare that's why you get the gray values signal strength uh, signal strength will change so the size the which is being measured will also change so then uh, that's what i was trying to illustrate that once the signal strength changes the uh, what the values the measurements will also change if you would have seen that this area would also have changed so that's the reason That's what you have to follow up clinically. Like, see the uh, the gold, st the gold standard is the disc examination. If you feel uh, according to the clin, or you can take at least disc photos. You can take and follow up with that. Camera wala ka. 